Assassin's Creed Unity, once seen as a generational failure for Ubisoft, has seen a total 180 when it comes to online discourse. While its rocky reputation still carries weight among general audiences, the last half decade has seen a throng of voices within the fanbase appraising Unity as a misunderstood gem that deserves a second chance. As you can tell by the title of this video, I'm not one of those voices, but I still do understand why so many people have come to feel that way. The visuals are instantly striking, the free-running animations are instantly eye-catching, and the black box missions are instantly compelling. And, almost more importantly than any of that, the game isn't Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Nothing elevates fan opinion on something old more than something new that they don't like. And so when Ubisoft removed social stealth, streamlined free-running, added rpg light mechanics, and removed long-standing iconography like the Hidden Blade, there was something of an exodus back to Unity by those who felt it better represented the series as they saw it. This video does not exist to compare the old games to the new ones. Plenty of people have done that better than I can. But I do believe that the same rhetoric that drowned out Unity's genuinely innovative mechanics with endless articles about faceless NPCs also drowned out the many legitimate flaws that plague Unity to this day, patches and all. And this goes beyond performance issues and shoddy co-op. Every interesting idea or mechanic in this game comes with a caveat, from the free-running, to the combat, to the story, to the beautiful city of Paris itself. I understand why people ask for Ubisoft to return to the mechanics we see in Unity. I too still do want that perfect Assassin's Creed game where the parkour is flashy and responsive, the assassinations are open and creative, and the world itself is denser than it is large. But I do not believe Unity is that game. I understand how it tried to be, but what I see when I look at it is a rushed, broken, and lazy game, where the corporate greed that forced it to launch in such an infamously bad state is still more than present in every facet of the experience in ways that could never be patched. As much as fans want an Assassin's Creed game that lives up to the franchise's original vision, I believe we deserve much better than to settle for Assassin's Creed Unity. By far the aspect of Unity that people have put on the highest pedestal now that the new games exist is the free-running system. Looking at some of the things that YouTubers are able to pull off online, it's easy to see why. I mean, just look at it. There are so many unique animations, and it feels like the main character, Arno, has so much more flexibility in his movement than any other character in this series. Perhaps the greatest innovation behind this is the parkour up and down system. In the past, you were essentially either in a free-running state or you weren't. But with parkour up and down, moving forward, climbing, and descending, now each had dedicated controls and a lot of new and unique animations. With parkour up, you can run diagonally up a wall, spin from a ledge to a rooftop, or hop from wall to wall to quickly ascend a tight alleyway. While with parkour down, you can dive to a rope and swing down to street level, slide down a church rooftop, or twirl down a series of posts to smoothly reach the ground. When I look at this system, there is one major piece of credit that I have to give it. No video game in the entire industry, in my opinion, has attempted to give us a parkour system this flashy and expansive when it comes to different actions the protagonist can pull off. Some of these videos make me feel like I'm watching one of the most innovative mechanics in gaming history. But then I actually try to play it myself. Now don't get me wrong, you can look at these videos online and imitate all of the cool stuff that you see people doing with some practice, and with time you can start creating your own routes through Paris. But one of the reasons so many people bounced off this game when it came out was because actually trying to utilize the parkour system in this game can feel inconsistent, obtuse, and frustrating. Why is this? What exactly is wrong with Assassin's Creed Unity's traversal that makes it so inaccessible to a new player? And is it something that can be fixed through practice? Well, for starters, any good traversal system requires an ability to read environmental cues to understand what actions you can perform on what parts of the world. At its simplest level, you have games like Uncharted that will highlight stuff you can climb in bright yellow. But in Assassin's Creed, you need to be able to climb almost anything, so what indicators can you provide to help the player understand how to navigate these worlds? The original Assassin's Creed did this by taking cues from the old Tomb Raider games. Those games revolutionized traversal back in their day by creating platforming challenges that were built on clear grids. An experienced player always knew what jumps they could or couldn't make once they had a feel for the spacing of the grid. And so once those clear and identifiable rules were put in place, players had the freedom to experiment and bend those rules as far as they would go to maximize the potential of the system. If you look back at Assassin's Creed, it followed a very similar principle. 
There are more contextual moves, and Altair will have different animations depending on the distance of the object he is snapping to, but at the end of the day, the cities of the original Assassin's Creed are very much a series of cubes. When Altair climbs up a wall, you know exactly where he will place his hands, and if you make a jump, you know if Altair will land on his feet or grab the ledge. The predictability of the character's movements also made it easier for the devs to focus on animation blending and transitions, which is why it can be so hard to tell when one animation ends and the next begins. Now, as the series went on, the grid got less defined and the animations became faster and more realistic. By the time we hit the Kenway Saga, while the quality of the animations themselves was unprecedented, we were starting to see the gaps between animations get clearer as the worlds became too complex to always have a perfect blend of animations to match any scenario. That long history lesson brings us back to Arno and the city of Paris. Paris is gorgeous, itself a triumph of animation, and a piece of art that makes Unity worthy of existence for its inclusion alone. I am amazed every time I boot up this game and look at what still feels like the most meticulously detailed game world I have ever seen from an artistic perspective. And yet, the synergy between the artistry and the mechanical side of things can feel lacking at times. Every wall of Paris has so many handholds and so many obstacles that it feels like a free runner's paradise, and yet the grid of the old games feels more vague than ever. In a city like Venice in AC2, there are clear paths with posts and poles spaced perfectly apart to accommodate Ezio's animations. Climbable walls are always just the right height, and if there is a platform in front of Ezio, he has an animation to get there smoothly. These platforms are on the grid. They are linear and built to look good, but you still have tools like manual jump and catch ledge to escape the grid and exercise more player freedom. The world of Paris is so much more complex than Venice, but sometimes the seemingly endless handholds and obstacles feel so arbitrarily placed. Arno will constantly stretch or compress his animations to reach the next platform, because even linear paths do not feel like they were built with his existing animations in mind. In AC2, you had platforming on the grid that looked clean, and platforming outside the grid that allowed for more player control. But in Unity, the grid is so vague that it might as well not exist at all, and objects aren't placed on it with looking smooth in mind. That is why the simple act of jumping from post to post can look so janky in Unity. But if the grid is less defined, does that mean that control and player freedom are emphasized instead? Well, not really, and that's because of a concept that many YouTubers who cover AC Unity have already discussed at length. The concept of automation, a term so coined by Leo K in this context. Now, Jacers and Leo K can talk about this idea much better than I can, so I'd encourage you to look up their channel since they are very much authorities on the free running in Unity compared to me. But basically, automation is when a character will decide what moves to utilize in any given situation based on context, not player input. I've talked about this a bit with AC1. Doing a jump over a small gap or a large gap will lead to different animations based on that distance. But Unity massively increases the level of automation. Depending on your exact position and camera movement, the game may tie a variety of different actions to the same inputs. Here is me trying to do the same jump three times before Arno actually does what I expect him to. My positioning is only very slightly different each time, and yet Arno performs three completely different actions. Automation works in cases where the game can reliably guess what action you were trying to perform, but Paris is so complex and Arno can go in so many different directions at any given time that the game will consistently guess wrong. Why does Arno climb some waist-high or even taller objects when I'm not pressing parkour up? Isn't the whole point of parkour up to avoid that? Is it really intuitive that the most efficient way to climb certain objects that are slightly taller than Arno is to hold parkour down, since his vault height cap is so bizarrely high? Why can I only hop to the side when there is something the game identifies I can eject to, when side ejects were so reliable in the older games? And then we get the icing on the cake that will really turn a lot of people off from this system and many others in this game. The input lag and the input queuing. The fact that there are situations where Arno can take almost a second to perform certain actions is a huge reason why Unity doesn't pass the field test for so many. I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally double tapped the button for a side hop and thought I was safe because Arno only jumped once, only for him to register that second jump later when I was already somewhere else entirely. And I don't have any proof of this other than my own field test, but I do feel like it's worse on console, where the frame rate still stays pretty low even on my PS5. I see it really clearly in the lockpicking minigame, which feels pretty normal on PC, but requires me to press the button well before the notch is anywhere near the lockpick zone on PS5. Again, I'm not trying to put words in the mouth of someone like Jacers, and if you want his opinion you can get it from his channel, not me parroting what he says. 
but in his parkour tier list that should have more views than it does due to his expertise, he talks about how the input lag is so much worse in Unity than any other game in the series, and how frustrating that can make it to play. You really, really feel that in all aspects of the game, whether that be in the parkour or the combat, or honestly even just in the menus sometimes. And so I do bring us back to a question I asked a few minutes ago. Is the jank at the core of Unity's freerunning something you can circumvent with practice? Well, to an extent, yes, you can definitely learn how to read the environment and become very proficient at maximizing fun and minimizing frustration. But at the same time, many of the people whose opinions I respect most when it comes to Unity's freerunning are very open about how much high-level play is spent fighting the game's systems, not to expand beyond its mechanics, but instead to even make them work as intended. The footage I am showing here is from a YouTuber who dedicates his entire channel to AC Parkour, and it showcases how frustrating this freerunning system can be even among skilled players. And so yes, you can get better at this game and learn how to make it look less choppy, but even at the highest level, this game is very much about taming and managing unwieldy systems. In the older games, you would master the grid so that you could learn how to break it and do cool stuff outside of the preset pathways laid out for you. In Unity, a significant amount of the time spent learning these systems involves figuring out how to read the environment so that you don't constantly get stuck on things or thrown in directions you don't want to go. The whole situation reminds me of Devil May Cry, the series is renowned for its complexity for a single-player title, and the skill gap between someone who just mashes triangle and someone who posts style flexes on YouTube is immense. But at the same time, that first player is still getting a perfectly fine, if simpler, view of the game. With Unity, on the other hand, the difference between a new player and an experienced player is the difference between an ugly, broken mess and a legitimately beautiful chain of animations. Watching someone like Leo K's videos on how to become better at Unity can help players get way more enjoyment out of the game's systems. But, at the same time, creators like himself have been very honest about the fact that the intended mechanics of the game have to be twisted and bent just to function at a basic level. Now, how that harms your experience is going to be based off preference. As I said before, there remains, to this day, nothing like Unity when it comes to the freerunning. And when you have a system that allows you to do things no other game in the world can, it makes sense for some people to get really into it and appreciate it, flaws and all. But that is not something that we owe Unity, and for me, I found these problems to be too abrasive and constant to forgive. The parkour didn't need another few months in the oven, it needed a total overhaul of its systems. The world design and animations needed to be built more collaboratively to better mesh with one another, scaling down automation would have required totally changing the control scheme to give the player more agency, and after all that, they still would have needed to smooth out the input lag and the poor animation blending. And when you make all of those changes, you're really not left with an improved version of Unity's system. You're left with a different system entirely. I understand why people say they want something more like Unity when they look at how the systems were simplified in Origins. The animations are fantastic, and Parkour Down should have legitimately been in every game since this one, because it's so good when it works. But, I think even a quick look under the hood shows how far Unity was from ever being that amazing parkour experience we were looking for. And regardless of how much you may prefer it to the new systems, we still deserve much better than what we got. Combat is very much in the same boat as the freerunning, and in that my initial reaction to this combat system on paper is, wow, what an improvement. As much as people pine for a return to the older combat systems these days, when the Ezio trilogy was new and exciting, the combat was definitely something that got lukewarm reviews. This was in large part due to the shallowness of its systems. The paired animations meant that combat was beautiful and fluid, with blades clashing and oftentimes not making contact with flesh until the killing blow. The flip side was that things like positioning, weapon type, and range were almost meaningless, due to the fact that animations were designed to hit regardless of where you were and what you were holding. Another YouTuber I really like, White Light, has talked about the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation in game mechanics. In a game like Brotherhood, exploring anything past the basic counter and chain kill loop relied entirely on the intrinsic desire to look cool and see new animations, because at the end of the day, choosing to fight with a dagger versus a spear resulted in minimal changes to how you actually played. It was very pretty, but people were looking for more depth. They wanted to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one duel that wasn't a joke because you could just counter every single attack. They wanted death to actually be possible. In theory, Unity's system feels like the perfect response. 
We get a system that focuses on timed parries and dodges instead of counter kills, and that ramps up enemy aggression and forces players to think quickly while retaining plenty of canned animations. This should have been exactly what players were looking for, but my gosh, it can feel awful to play. First off, like the parkour, the combat is incredibly choppy. This is annoying enough in traversal, but in combat, failure to read enemy movements can mean death, so getting hit by attacks that were nowhere near you or that skip their telegraph animation can be frustrating. There is a clear pause between all attack animations, and characters locked in combat will slide around the battlefield and teleport where they need to be in ways that look incredibly awkward. It looks nowhere near as fluid as the combat from the Ezio trilogy, and it retains so much of the sloppiness that we just talked about with the free running. But we aren't just talking about looks in Assassin's Creed anymore. Unity wants to bring depth to the discussion. Does it succeed? Well, kind of. It definitely does add difficulty, but I would argue it does so in a way that's pretty frustrating and unenjoyable. Your health in the early game is very low, and even when you're fully decked out, you can die in just a few hits if you go to the wrong neighborhood. But so far, so good, right? That's what we wanted. Well, I would feel that way if getting hit in this game registered as something that happened when you, as a player, failed to react in time to an attack. Here's a phrase kids will use a lot when a game is too hard for them. It's not even hard, it's just frustrating. Most of the time, this is a lie to make ourselves feel better, and that is somewhat the case in Unity. The enemies are legitimately more aggressive, and it can totally be hard to keep track of all the different attacks coming your way. But with that in mind, there are some aspects of Unity's combat that feel relatively simple to navigate without any trouble, and I want to go over them. Let's start with parrying. Parrying is basically the core of Unity's combat, and when you get surrounded, you're likely to spend as much time on defense as on offense. It's not an instant kill like the counter was in AC2, but at the same time it balances out by being easier to pull off. The game isn't trying to make it a high skill action like in a game like Sekiro. You're supposed to be comfortable parrying from the get-go, and the game does a lot to help you out. Firstly, the enemy health bar flashes yellow in a way that's pretty difficult to miss. It stays yellow for a very long time, and you have a really big window to press the button. Secondly, combat can feel very slow, which actually helps you here, as you see these attacks coming a mile away. In fact, many of the enemies will let out these goofy, full-body roars to really telegraph that an attack is coming. Thirdly, the parry is top tier in how often it can cancel other animations. Arno can be in the middle of a finisher kill and still teleport to be in the right position to perform the parry. It can look bad, but it will keep you alive. In addition to parries, you get a dodge button, and it can be overpowered in certain situations. Against a single enemy, you can be borderline invincible just by spamming the dodge. Enemies also still fall into the same pattern of having specific moves that don't work on them, and some that make short work of them. These heavy enemies have unblockable attacks, but if you get them isolated, you'll learn that they really have no way of defending against yours either. When you learn that you can't perfect parry the first attack from one of these elites, you might be taken aback, but they have a 3-hit combo that ends in a parry you can actually take advantage of. Spearmen may block everything you throw at them, but they can be parried and knocked to the ground as easily as anyone else. Every enemy has a solution. So with all the odds stacked in your favor, why isn't the low health pool enough to make this feel fair and balanced? Well, that is just it. Mix in these combat techniques with hours of practice and maybe some help from Lee OK to learn how to quick shot downed enemies to take down any adversary regardless of level, and you have a system that you can totally master pretty quickly. But mastery can only do so much in the face of jank. Obviously, the parry is great and gets plenty of telegraph time, especially with that big yellow bar above their head. But what if that bar never comes? It's incredibly common for the enemies to attack you without the telltale marker above their head flashing at all, making it easy to lose track of incoming attacks when surrounded by enemies. And what if your character just decides not to parry? I can't tell you how many times a combat encounter has started with an enemy aggroing on me, which should cause Arno to immediately enter a combat state, but instead he doesn't, and mash parry as I may, he just gets slapped to start the fight. I'm glad the parry cancels other animations, usually. Sometimes Arno will cancel out of an attack to parry an enemy behind him, but sometimes he will just keep slicing away and you will take the hit. The roll can be really useful, but enemies are still programmed to track your movements no matter where you go. They will slide a meter in any given direction to follow you, and it can look really awkward and weird. And remember that input queuing I talked about? Mash roll at the wrong time, and Arno may very well roll away a full second after you actually press the button right into an enemy attack. Speaking of paired animations, you get plenty of weapon variety, but because of the way the system works, there isn't a ton of difference between them. 
A two-handed gun will feel relatively similar to a sword, which will feel relatively similar to a spear. Your attacks will never whiff, because that's not how the system works, and it's not like range will ever matter. And the animation cancelling means that speed is also meaningless too, because it's not like you're going to get stuck in a big attack. At the end of the day, the damage stat of the weapon matters much more than any moveset, because there really isn't any depth in terms of weapon choice. Every single one of these problems, however, pales in comparison to this combat's biggest sin. The guns. Let's say you're lucky. Every parry cancels as intended. Every dodge is timed to perfection. None of the enemy attacks glitch out. What happens then? I got that thing on me. I got that stick. I got that tool. I'm packing. The enemies start pulling out guns that melt your health bar. So what do you do? You stop fighting. That's all you really can do. There are no human shields, and the dodge is very inconsistent against guns. One or two gunmen and you might be able to manage, but more than that, and you really have no combat tools to counter this. So you can throw a smoke bomb and leave, or you can throw a smoke bomb and try to kill everyone while they're blind, but either way, the actual fighting is over. And that is where the game's true difficulty comes in. Because in all honesty, this combat system is very solvable. It makes some improvements over the older games as far as depth goes, but the huge parry window, overpowered attack options, and limited enemy movesets mean that you can get this combat system down to a T. But no matter how good you get, you can't fight large groups of enemies because they will start to shoot you and there will be no counter for that. Sometimes they'll shoot you with no warning indicator. Sometimes multiple will shoot at the same time and you won't be able to dodge. And sometimes you'll try to run away only to realize that the game has no dodge mechanic outside of a combat state, so you're a sitting duck with no options. Instead of making this combat legitimately difficult enough to incentivize stealth, they bypass it entirely by giving enemies an end fight ability if you shouldn't be able to win a fight, regardless of whether or not you can win it. They could have given the enemies more complex movesets, toned down animation cancelling, and reduced parry timing. But they didn't do that. The enemies just shoot you. That is artificial difficulty at its most egregious. Another reason the combat stands out as so bad is that other games have since done very similar systems really well. Look at Ghost of Tsushima. A lot of this system works exactly like Unity's does. You have a timed parry and a perfect parry, a roll to escape enemy attacks and arrows, and a variety of tools to utilize between attacks. But in Ghost of Tsushima, it feels incomparably better to actually play. The animations are much faster, perfect parries get immediate follow-up instead of having to wait for a sluggish animation, hitboxes matter more and allow for your attacks to miss if your positioning is off, and the system is all around more complex with its different stances and abilities. Plus it has some great one-on-one -on -one duels, while Unity's duels are still an absolute joke of easy parries and slow attacks. At least the free running is unique for all its problems. The combat has been done better by plenty of other studios. Ghost of Tsushima has its flaws, and it's by no means using the exact same system as Unity, but it's because of games like it that we know what a good parry should feel like, what a good dodge roll should feel like, and what a good one-on-one -on -one fight should feel like. The combat in Unity has none of this. I've seen people call for a return to Unity's combat because they think it feels more like a middle ground between the style-focused games of Ezio's era and the new hitbox combat systems. But once again, I do not really care how good the ideas behind this combat were. At the end of the day, I care about how it actually felt in my hands. From its sluggish animations, to its inconsistent mechanics, to its artificial difficulty, everything about this feels bad to play. Do I personally like the idea of AC going back to a parry system with a balance of stylish animations and in-depth abilities? Sure I do. But of all the games to look for inspiration from in that department, we deserve way better than regressing back to what Unity was trying to offer us. As I progress through this video, you're going to find my thoughts on these different aspects of Assassin's Creed Unity more and more predictable. How do I feel about the stealth in this game? Well, lo and behold, I think it had great ideas on paper and dropped the ball in execution. I get confused when I hear people say they want Assassin's Creed to return to its stealth-based roots. As a huge stealth fan, I've found that the stealth in every single AC game has been kind of bare bones. Back in the old days, stealth consisted of walking behind or getting above isolated guards to kill them one by one. The Kenway Saga added in the stealth zones that on one hand massively increased the options for sneaking around on the ground level, but on the other hand also gave players a crutch that ran the risk of making things a bit too dull. 
Unity was the game that was going to make Assassin's Creed a real stealth series. No more getting made fun of for not having a crouch. Arno can squat just as deep as Snake or Sam Fisher. Fully fleshed out interiors would allow for traditional stealth corridors and maze-like paths through lock-pickable doors and open windows. No longer would guards be out on their own just waiting to be stabbed. You'd actually need to use your stealth arsenal to manipulate your environment properly if you wanted a chance at getting through any given area unseen. Like the parkour system, it really was a step in the exact direction fans wanted the series to go, at least on paper. I honestly think they do a lot more right with this stealth system than they managed with the combat, but when we discuss the mechanical problems that plague this game, stealth by no means escapes unscathed. Let's start with the detection system, which can make or break any stealth game. Enemy detection in Unity is, predictably, very broken. First off, it's not intuitive exactly which guards will be aggroed if you get seen. Getting caught in a building courtyard can have guards on the third floor chasing after you. This is made especially frustrating by the snipers, who in this game have a ridiculous range of detection. It can be tough to so much as poke your head out to survey your surroundings without getting pinged from across the map. Having to work around enemies who have the high ground is common in stealth games, but in some missions, especially co-op missions where enemies are tuned for more players, it's not uncommon to see snipers absolutely littering the rooftops. And when one sniper seeing you out of the corner of their eye can mean the entire map knows where you are sometimes, that can be frustrating. That's on top of the fact that getting seen through certain walls is a pretty regular occurrence in Unity. While detection can really screw you sometimes, it's also very breakable. I haven't talked about it a lot yet, but the AI in this game is just so stupid. Want to farm some cover kills? Camp in the right spot and they'll just run into your blade, diligently one at a time. Want to absolutely blast one guard away in front of his friends? Flip a coin. Chances are if you position yourself right, they might be willing to forget that happened pretty quick. Then comes the famously clunky cover system, something that you'll have to use consistently if you want to sneak through any given area. The game employs very sticky cover mechanics that pull you hard to the side of any given piece of cover. And when I say hard, I mean hard. Accidentally press the button in the middle of a hallway and Arno might just dive to the side to hug whatever flat surface he can get his body up against. On top of that, I think it's a big problem that I had to watch a Lee OK guy just to learn how to get off a box without exposing myself, because leaving cover isn't always smooth and intuitive either. Unity does give us some tools that can actually bypass a lot of these issues. Smoke bombs are less OP in combat in this game, but a lifesaver in stealth. Using them reactively can get you out of a lot of sticky situations. Using them proactively can help you get the drop on a group of enemies no matter their number. They don't escape iffy detection issues, however, like here where you see that me deploying a smoke bomb actually gets me caught here, despite no one looking at me at the time. Then we have the cherry bomb, which is also very useful, but only if you understand how Ubisoft screwed it up. For whatever reason, this sound-based device doesn't operate on sound at all, but instead on line of sight. If any obstacle stands between a guard and where you threw the bomb, it won't even register for them. The thing that arguably got the most press prior to release was the Phantom Blade, which is essentially a wrist launcher that fires lethal or berserk darts at enemies. It basically serves the same purpose as the blow dart from AC4. The tool works great for clearing out snipers or berserking a heavy, but it can be very finicky. I get more input lag and queuing issues with the Phantom Blade than any other action in the game, and I honestly don't even know why. I can't tell you how many times I've had to press the button multiple times just to get it to fire once, and visually, half the time Arno isn't even pointing the blade at his enemies when he kills them, but they're nice enough to drop anyways. Automatic targeting gets botched as often as it works if there are multiple enemies around. You get used to seeing one guard get highlighted only for Arno to betray your trust and shoot someone else entirely, and the targeting in general can be iffy even outside of the Phantom Blade. Stand above two enemies and all you can do is pray that Arno will actually double assassinate them, because oftentimes he'll just decide to target one and leave the other for a rainy day. All of this combines for a traditional stealth system that is leaps and bounds more interested in actually giving you stealth tools than the previous games, yet is so inconsistent and sloppy that I'd rather just run from bush to bush in AC4, despite how meticulously crafted some of your stealth options are. But traditional stealth isn't all that Assassin's Creed strives for. Social stealth has to be discussed, because back in Unity's day, that was still expected. Social stealth is where you, as a player, get to actually follow the titular Assassin's Creed and use your environment to your advantage. You get to be a blade in the crowd, hiding in plain sight. Throughout the games, this became about using the crowd and your environment as a whole to remain invisible to your foes in broad daylight. 
You would hire factions to cause distractions, throw money to rile up the crowd, blend with a group of people to get closer to a target, or use benches and other hiding spots to escape detection. It was cool, but by the Kenway saga, I was getting a little weary of social stealth and its lack of innovations. I remember one mission where you tail someone through Kingston and out into the wilderness outside the city. While in an urban environment, I would tail them by walking from crowd to crowd to stay invisible. While in the wilderness, I would walk from bush to bush to stay invisible. Surely, if every crowd in this game served the same mechanical function as a bush, there are more ways that Ubisoft could have been innovating this feature. And so perhaps Unity would do this. Unity's enormous crowds were a huge selling point for the game in the lead-up to its release. Thousands of NPCs on screen at any given time? Sounds pretty fantastic. And big they were. Big, and that's about it. It's undeniably exciting to find yourself in the center of a seemingly endless crowd, totally invisible to your enemies. And you actually do have a lot of room to perform assassinations from these crowds, which, once again, exploit the stupid AI. But that's it. Once the novelty of these huge crowds is gone, they really are just one big field of grass for all intents and purposes. A really big and complex and visually unstable hiding spot. Maybe it's asking too much, but I wanted social stealth to evolve in ways that allowed me to manipulate the crowds in exciting ways to open up new stealth opportunities. But in Unity, crowds hide you and help you get into some places, but a vast majority of your stealth experience is spent in a very traditional manner, with no real way to interact with these social systems. On top of that, you don't have the gentle pushing or tackling options of the older games, and so when running through a crowd, Arno slows to a frustrating jog and regularly gets stuck behind NPCs. Is it terrible? No, I wouldn't say so, although I will get to some of the technological instability more with these crowds later. I just found the social stealth unmemorable. There are some really cool missions that let you use the systems a little more, but they were too few and far between for me. And finally, stealth isn't just about what you as a player can do, but also about the situations you're put in. And black box missions sound like a pretty fantastic place to start there. A black box mission in Assassin's Creed is a mission where a target is somewhere in a particular area and you have to take them out by any means necessary. Played Hitman, played Dishonored, it's that but with the mobility of an Assassin's Creed character. Awesome! These are exactly the kinds of missions we as fans wanted when AC1 was announced, and while that game didn't really hit the mark in my opinion, Unity gives us a lot more to chew on. It doesn't tell you what to do or how to do it, it gives you a photo, points you in the direction of a couple special opportunities, and lets you loose. I was really glad they added these missions in, and while I may not love the game overall, they are a highlight of the experience. I think they're good. I don't think they're great. I think anyone who's only played AC games could be blown away by these missions, but if you have any experience with Dishonored or Hitman, like I said, you might find that these missions fall a bit short of expectations. While they are advertised as sandboxes where you can kill your target however you want, it didn't always feel that way. The assassination opportunities often lay out a single linear way you can kill your target, and that can make it feel like there's a correct, canon way to get the job done. The missions are by no means created equal. Some enemies are constantly on the move, giving you different options to get at them. Others, like the King of Beggars in your second black box mission, will always be in the same place, limiting your overall options. The Notre Dame has multiple hidden entrances and a really cool cutscene that plays if you set up the kill in the right way. Meanwhile, Lafreniere's assassination takes place in what is essentially a big rectangle that he just walks around ad nauseum. The game also had me thinking you'd get these really cool cinematic kills every time you use these opportunities, but that won't actually come until Syndicate. In Unity, you can get this confessional kill for the very first one, but everything after that is just a standard knife to the throat. I quite like this mission near the end where you assassinate Latouche. You're not infiltrating a building of any kind, but instead trying to kill a man on a stage with thousands of people watching. It's different, and while the snipers take some of the fun out of it, I liked actually using the social stealth mechanics a bit more. This mission did, however, really highlight how vague the game is about some of the assassination opportunities. They like to make it a surprise as to what exactly each opportunity does, so on your first playthrough you're just going out to these markers because you're told to, not really because you know how they'll actually help. In this mission you have the opportunity to find a key that unlocks a cage housing political dissidents awaiting execution. So I go to the cage and Arno gets inside and locks himself in. Okay, I didn't really expect that. But they then escort me out, I am led up the stairs, and I kill my target. It is cool, even though Latouche does recognize you right at the end, and I'm pretty sure you have to get caught. 
But at the same time, this was an entirely linear sequence during which I made precisely zero decisions of my own. I think on games like Hitman, where every NPC could lead to a disguise that offers a different way to approach the mission, or Dishonored 2, where I can kill or spare any of my targets in such a wide variety of ways. And I'm left wishing that Unity did just a little more to make me feel like I was forging my own path through these black box missions beyond the independent form of infiltration I was already doing in the regular stealth missions. It is unfair to compare it to games like that where black box type stealth is the whole point, but I still wish these missions lived up to their potential a little more. Even outside these black box missions, I can't help but continue comparing Unity to better games. While it's fantastic that stealth got such a clear focus, interiors were finally interesting to explore, and you could finally crouch one full console life cycle into the series, all of these things were already being done fantastically for a decade in other games. Metal Gear Solid V, one of the most mechanically impressive stealth games ever, would come out just one year after Unity. We as gamers knew what a good detection system, stealth toolbox, and crouch cover system was supposed to look like. But even if we just exclusively look at Ubisoft, Splinter Cell Blacklist came out the year before Unity, and even though many fans felt like it was a watered-down stealth experience compared to a game like Chaos Theory, it puts Unity's systems to shame. The cover system alone that allowed for relatively consistent and cool-looking cover transitions makes me baffled that Unity's is so bad. Add some really cool mobility options and some incredibly stylish kills in both motion and from a neutral stance, and sometimes it feels like Blacklist does AC stealth better than Unity does. And heck, Watch Dogs came out right before Unity, and for all its failures, it had better cover and detection mechanics. And some of the missions where you have to hack other players without getting caught gave me stronger social stealth vibes than Unity's actual social stealth. I don't know how the heck you fix the parkour in this game, and the combat fell too far from the mark to imagine patches ever solving anything there. But stealth? You can see a passable stealth system in here so clearly. Better cover mechanics, a refined detection system, and tweaks to the tools to make them more intuitive would have gone a long way toward making this the best stealth in the series. And a lot of people will still say that it is, because at least it tried to pass itself off as a stealth game, unlike many of the others in this series. But I'm not one of those people. I watch online stealth compilations, like this one from Sad, a YouTuber who has created some of the best Unity content on the platform, and the high-level gameplay they pull off has me floored. Nothing in the industry looks like this. I get that while MGS and Splinter Cell and Hitman may be more well-made as stealth games, they still don't fully scratch that itch of being able to climb anything and infiltrate anywhere like an AC game can. Then I watch videos like this one where that same person records 381 attempts to get through this mission stylishly, and has the AI and mechanics work in the way they intended through that first checkpoint 20 of those times. Seeing how inconsistent and broken the stealth can be even at the highest level of play, I'm reminded why I don't like the stealth in this game. I don't like it because no matter how many more options this game has than the older or even the newer AC games, we know what a good stealth system is supposed to feel like. Other games have shown us that. And this is not it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but to say that Assassin's Creed Unity is a gorgeous game is borderline objective. Setting your urban exploration game in revolutionary Paris is setting yourself up for success, and the tight alleys and tall buildings are everything AC fans have always wanted. Unity was the first game in the series to recreate its city at a one-to-one -one scale, giving it a sense of immensity that no other game in the franchise has really achieved. Something I hear a lot is that Unity still has the best graphics in the series. And you know what? In many ways, it still does. The texture detail on every single building in the city is fantastic, and it makes every frame of this game feel artistically dense. The devs weren't able to figure out a day-night cycle in this game, but that almost works to its benefit. We now have baked-in lighting, and it's a clear standout in Unity. It just looks so real, almost like I can feel the heat radiating off the rooftops as I stand above the city streets. As much as I like day-night cycles, it's gorgeous enough here that I can't say its removal hurts the game all that much. In many ways, it is the presentation of the game that gives it its reputation. If you look at Eivor's character model, she clearly looks much more modern and detailed than Arno does. But Arno's facial capture is leaps ahead of Valhalla, and so everything just looks so much more advanced. Unity's presentation is, in many ways, best in class. I believe Paris is a triumph, and I see stories about how much time and effort went into meticulously recreating that world, and I'm grateful for the work the team put in. 
At the same time, there are, once again, still some caveats. As far as how the game looks when you're running along the rooftops, I could easily see someone hailing this as the best setting in the franchise. I have more problems when I'm at the ground level, however, and that's because of one factor I've already brought up. The crowds. The crowds in this game might as well be liquid when it comes to how variable their textures are going to be. In general, only the NPCs closest to you will have their textures fully loaded in, and everyone else's will be popping in and out all the time. Textures have always been variable in AC, but Unity is on a whole nother level. Compared to the gradually fading in flowers of Brotherhood or the instantly appearing guards in AC3, the texture pop-in with Unity is something that is constant and unavoidable. While it is initially technically impressive to see so many NPCs on screen at once, it's so abundantly clear that Ubisoft didn't figure out how to do it technologically. I find it frustrating when I hear people say that we should return to the large crowds that Unity had, because I really don't think they succeeded here. Having played on PS4, PS4 Pro, PS5, and two different PC rigs now, I have never seen any meaningful improvements to NPC pop-in. Through all the beauty, sloppiness like that pervades through the entire experience. Take the cutscenes, for example, which have that amazing facial capture that we discussed earlier. Every actor's performance carries over fantastically, but in contrast to that, a lot of the shots in these cutscenes are close-ups that choose to turn the bokeh blur effect up to 100. Some scenes of the game can downright hurt my eyes and give the characters this weird aura around their bodies where they clash with that blurred background. It looks less like a cinematic technique and more like Arno is using the blur feature on Zoom. I also noticed that transitions looked sloppy in this game, and I realized upon slowing the footage down that the blur actually disappears one frame before the scene actually cuts in many cases, which makes it feel slower. The cinematography, if you can call it that in a video game, can be very weak. Action scenes are plagued by Taken-style quick cuts and shaky cam, and it's frustrating to reflect back on a time where that kind of shot selection was common. I appreciate that the game is more consistently cinematic than Origins or Odyssey, but I look at the cutscenes that those games do get and they look so much better when it comes to camera placement. It kind of sucks that the game with the best facial animation and some amazing mocap has such ugly camera work. Also, I feel I should mention the accents because so many people did complain about them. This is the only game in the series where the actors in general don't do an accent appropriate to the region, instead speaking with an English accent here. I don't mind this overall, because doing an accent doesn't always land, but there are definitely places where this works better than others. Dangenot, for example, flows between English and French perfectly smoothly. Give me le roi des thunes, and I'll spare you your life. Other actors, well, maybe a bit less so. Well, the assassins already found Siver and the roi des thunes. But all that aside, the overall presentation of Assassin's Creed Unity remains the best part of the game, and I'm always happy to boot it up just to run around and take in the sights, even with its flaws. But that said, running around does tend to be all I do, given another big problem I have with Unity. I don't like the side content. Assassin's Creed games live and die by their settings, and the best of them will give you the opportunity to engage with fun activities that immerse you further in the experience of either living in the period or being an assassin in that time period. Let's take Unity within the context of when it came out, sandwiched between AC4 and AC Syndicate. AC4 is set during the golden age of piracy, and so you can sail your ship, hunt for treasure, engage in secret naval boss battles, infiltrate plantations and forts, and go whaling. And then on top of that, you still have your suite of assassination contracts, along with a set of fully fleshed out narrative missions that see you working for the Brotherhood, that 100% feel just as well done as any story missions in that game. In Syndicate, you explore Victorian London, and so you find yourself liberating child laborers, engaging in carriage chases, starting gang wars, traveling on the roof of a train, or honing in your combat skills at the local fight club, all while maintaining plenty of focus on stealth and assassination. Unity, by comparison, is much less interested in immersing you either in the city of Paris or the assassin fantasy through its content. The most common form of side content is the Paris stories, which are generally one-off missions that don't feed into the grander picture of the game. They can certainly be interesting, but very few of them expand beyond running somewhere, either killing someone, getting into a fight, or stealing something, and then running back. It's a far cry from the wide variety of setting-appropriate activities you get in the games immediately before and after this one. More missions involving the Revolution or the Brotherhood would have gone a long way, there is minimal dialogue in these missions, and while other AC games will alternate between mo-capped cutscenes and this behind-the-shoulder type view, Unity gets neither. 
You walk up to the NPC, press interact, and their audio track plays. It feels very impersonal, and Arno almost never says a word before, during, or after these missions. While Odyssey also suffers from repetitive side content, at least Cassandra has spoken dialogue for every encounter. Outside of the main story, Arno feels more like a blank slate avatar for the player than any other character in the series, because his personality almost never comes out in any way outside of the mainline cutscenes. It brings to mind the Homestead missions of AC3. In that game, I felt the main character of Renun Hagedu missed the mark in the main story, but he was redeemed in the Homestead missions where we got to see a wiser, more idealistic side of him. Arno gets nothing like this, and you can go dozens of hours without hearing him talk at all. Things get a bit better with the riddles and murder mysteries, which still don't give Arno any personality, but actually give the players legitimately difficult puzzles to solve. The murder mysteries are still just about walking places and pressing the interact button, but in this case it really does work, and it's nice having an entirely cerebral set of missions that don't involve any combat. The Nostradamus Enigma riddles are a step above that, asking you to solve riddles that require a fairly strong knowledge of the time period that the game won't just hand you. I felt these riddles were a bit obtuse for me, or maybe I was just a bit obtuse for them, I'm not sure, but I am sure that they do have their audience. The last one I want to talk about is the co-op missions, which should be the best missions in the game. They are actually fully fleshed out missions with their own cutscenes, unlike the Paris stories. They also let you interact with the French Revolution directly, something that, as I will discuss more later, the game is weirdly against letting you do most of the time. And these missions can be fun if you have friends, and there was an undeniable level of technical effort put into crafting these compared to all the other side content. But if the game felt unstable in single player, everything is tenfold in the multiplayer. The AI is unwieldy when you are alone, so imagine what it's like when it's split between three other players. Tools work less consistently, glitches that I don't see in the single player show up constantly, and all of the detection issues feel so much worse in the co-op. I also wish that these missions weren't framed as weird objectives given to you by your modern day handler, where once again, Arno doesn't speak. These were fantastic opportunities to let Arno interact more with the Brotherhood and actually do missions for them as opposed to just doing his own thing like he is for most of the main story, but we get none of that. Instead, some lady on a laptop tells us what we need to do, and we do it. Patong has valuable Templar secrets, and he's no good to the assassin's dead. Get to the notebook, then save Patong. And those are the good co-op missions. Go over to the heists, which are just missions where you walk up to a bunch of different paintings and press interact until the game says you did it, and you quickly wonder where the heck the quality from the regular co-op went. Wah, wah. These are boring and frustrating for the most part, and I had very little desire to return to them. The side missions really aren't bad in Assassin's Creed Unity, but they just felt so mediocre. Pretty much every game from Brotherhood on had at least one set of side missions that I couldn't wait to do more of, from the Leonardo Machine missions, to the Homestead missions, to the AC4 Brotherhood missions. In Unity, the side content felt like padding. Serviceable and sometimes fairly enjoyable padding, but fluff nonetheless. It didn't add to the setting or the character of Arno in any real way. Speaking of fluff, it's easy to see why 2014 was the year that audiences really started pushing back against bloat in Ubisoft games. This is what my map looks like on my 100% save file, and it's still a mess. And that's not even bringing up all the stupid companion app content that locks certain chests and activities behind logging into the app regularly. To Ubisoft's credit, now that the app is dead and buried, you have access to all that content from the get-go, so I'm not really going to talk about it more. So much of the side content is one note, and so little of it tries to enmesh the player in the fantasy of being part of the French Revolution or a part of the Assassin Brotherhood. While Paris is so central to the experience of Unity, the content within her feels so shallow compared to a majority of the games in this series. It's so beautiful, and yet there's a hollowness to this world when it comes to actually having interesting things to do in it. So we know what activities Arno can do in the city of Paris, but how exactly does he progress as an assassin himself? Well, the answer to that is kind of complicated. No, not this complicated, but still way too complex and, in all honesty, financially gross for a primarily single-player game. So in Assassin's Creed Unity, there are a whopping four different currencies that you need to manage, which is iOS levels of complex monetization. Let's go over them one by one. First you have Livres, the actual in-universe currency that Arno canonically uses to purchase consumables and weapons. Simple enough. Next we have Sync Points, 
Assassin's Creed Unity was really the first game in the series to start emphasizing light RPG elements, and they come in the form of skills that you can purchase as you progress through different missions. You spend sync points to get basic skills like environmental blending and double assassinate, but eventually you can be using them on more advanced weapon skills that some people might miss entirely. So long as you engage with the co-op missions, you should be getting plenty of sync points to get all the skills you need, and I didn't think they were terribly paced throughout the experience. Next we have Creed Points. This currency has such a stupid name that I wish it didn't exist based on that alone. Creed points are by far the most redundant currency in the game. You get them from doing... anything, really, and they allow you to upgrade the weapons that you've bought, and that's pretty much it. Nothing that we could not have been able to do with the levers. They are also tied to the little title that you get under your name, if you happen to be someone who cares about that. Finally, we have the one we all knew would be here. Helix Credits. These are the tokens that you can buy with real money. Most weapons or armor pieces in the game can be purchased through real-life money, and you can shell out $100 at a time through the in-game store. A single high-level weapon can cost 1,000 Helix Credits, and for $100 you get 20,000, meaning you are spending $5 of real money on the highest level sword that you have access to if you go that route. It feels gross. I'm not going to compare microtransactions to decide which ones are worse. In fully-priced single-player games, they're almost always disgusting. The XP boosts you can get in the more recent games to speed up progress are just as unacceptable. But every time you open up your equipment screen to buy weapons or armor, you will see the icon there, telling you that you can skip the grind and pick out any weapon you want right off the bat. Do you have to buy these? No. They're all available in-game. But in my playthrough, I have 100%ed the game, I've done all the missions that I can, and if I wanted every weapon and armor piece that I don't yet have, I would need to spend 95,130 Helix Credits. That means I would need to spend $500 of real money after having done everything in the game. And we just talked about what the content is like. Once you 100% everything, that's it. You've really done it all. The only way I could grind this money if I wanted to would be to leave my game on for a few hours waiting for my income chest to fill up, or run heists over and over again, which, while doable, isn't exactly fun. And you don't have to get everything in the game. I think there is value in games where you can invest in something and take that risk. But let's be honest, that's not why Ubisoft priced everything beyond what 100%ing the game would normally get you. They did it because even if you do not have to spend that money, there are people out there who will. In Unity, someone can buy the best weapon in the game right at the start and one-shot pretty much every single enemy if they want to. Ubisoft knew the whales would come and spend hundreds on Unity, and while I doubt there were many of them, I guarantee they existed. And so we have all these ludicrously priced items in Unity that have that microtransaction stamp plastered all over them. I can really see why some people might get frustrated with the difficulty because of this as well. In one of my playthroughs, I tried to see what it was like to just stick to the story in Unity, never doing side content, and it can be really rough. It can take multiple missions just to get enough money to refill your consumables, which can cost thousands in the late game. It's ridiculously expensive. And that's not even getting into the boosts. I didn't even know they existed until relatively recently, but they let you boost Arno's health, damage, or stealth abilities for three minutes, with an option to buy premium versions for five. Now that is disgusting. I can't imagine anyone ever using them, but looking at the balancing issues in enemy health and damage, especially in co-op, it's hard to give Ubisoft the benefit of the doubt and imagine they weren't taking these boosts into account when designing these systems. Outside of mechanical and skill-based progression, you also have the cosmetic changes that you can make to your character. And these are actually really cool. You get a ton of control over your own customization with a pretty solid range of hood, torso, bracer, and leg options, along with different belts that basically let you create builds based on what consumables you want to have the most of. Since we are on the topic of customization, I do want to bring up those allegations of sexism that popped up before Unity's launch that took up a lot of the press about the game at that time. Basically, there was an interview where the creative director of the game said that they had planned to add female avatars to the co-op, but that the option was cut because it would be too much work to add all the customization options and animations. This caused immediate uproar, and those comments dominated the news articles written about Unity for a long time prior to launch. The situation was really bizarre. So, in co-op you play as Arno, and everyone else sees themselves as playing as Arno as well, but for you they have their face models swapped. The multiplayer is meant to be a continuation of the single player experience, so it makes total sense that they would only have the animations and customization options for Arno. So why didn't they just say that? 
To this day, the AC Unity Wikipedia page has a 780-word section dedicated to the co-op gender option controversy. They basically had the perfect answer for people who asked why you couldn't customize gender, and yet they still threw that to the side and went with the women are too hard to animate answer instead. It's just baffling. And so with all this in mind, I recently took a step back and looked at the sometimes weird, sometimes disgusting progression system in Unity, and I started realizing something. Something about the way Arno silently moved from quest to quest to scrounge up enough money to afford better gear reminded me of a certain gaming experience, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Despite the RPG elements, doesn't really feel like an RPG, and as bad as the monetization is, it obviously doesn't feel like a mobile game. But then it hit me. The game Assassin's Creed Unity was reminding me of was Final Fantasy XIV. The side content and progression system of this game feel like playing an MMO. You travel around the region, going from quest to quest, throughout which the protagonist is a player avatar with little to no dialogue. These quests are generally simple in nature and involve a lot of running places, performing a task, and running back. As a player avatar, your character is given a wide range of customization options that seem tailored to making you stand out in multiplayer, letting you hang out in a lobby with a banana man or a man in black medieval armor. It isn't Arno's name in the top left corner, it's your gamer tag. And remember that title under your name? Again, this is a 100% save file, and I'm only halfway to the highest level. I would need to do everything I've done in this 60-hour save file a second time over just to max out this title that doesn't do anything. It clearly wasn't made with single player in mind, existing only to flex on other players in co-op. Because of limited single player content, the game wants you to be running the same quests over and over to get expensive gear and boost your title. That's what the end game looks like. Now don't get me wrong, I love Final Fantasy XIV, but AC Unity feels like it takes some of the worst aspects of the MMO experience and sticks them in a 60-hour game that's primarily single-player. No main character in the entire series gets less personality in the side content than Arno, and it all reminded me of walking from NPC to NPC performing random tasks in the old Realm Reborn story of FF14, which, in my opinion, was the worst part of that game. Progression in Unity is just weird. It has way too many forms of currency, the in-game economy feels tuned around microtransactions, and the systems make navigating this game feel more like an MMO at times than a single-player game. It feels so unfocused, and if there is one aspect of AC Unity, I think a lot of people are going to be able to agree Ubisoft shouldn't return to in any capacity, regardless of whether or not you think other games may do it worse, it would be these progression systems. I have been very cynical so far, and I don't like being that way. I like talking about successes and triumphs, and in any game, whatever its flaws, a strong story can do a lot to sway me toward giving it the benefit of the doubt. That's why, after everything I've already talked about, it was the story of this game that really cemented it as one of my least favorite in this series. Unity gets off to a rousing start by giving Arno not one, but two Dad Death origin stories in the span of 30 minutes. Ezio and Redunigedu were both shaped by the death of a parent, and so Unity gives Arno double the character development by having it happen to him twice. While doubling down on a well-worn trope feels lazy on its own, what makes it more frustrating is how the first dad death really just exists to set up the second one. It is the adoptive father's death that drives the entire story, while Arno's biological father is rarely mentioned again. If they were going to make the redundant decision to kill two dads in one hour, I would have preferred if they had gone further in depth into the feelings of shame and fear of loss that Charles's death instilled in Arno. Instead, one dad death is mostly just a stepping stone to a more important dad death. At the very least, either one of them could have gotten more than a single scene where they actually get back and forth dialogue with Arno, but neither of them do. The other frustrating thing about the setup for this game is how the events surrounding this second death, that of Monsieur de la Serre, are handled. Everything that happens in Unity ties back to Arno's own role in his adoptive father's death. This happens on the day that Elise, Delacere's daughter and Arno's secret lover slash adopted sister, is scheduled to be home from her travels abroad for only one night for reasons that aren't shared with Arno, which upsets him because he's at a point in his life where his best friend is her portrait at the estate, so he'd very much like to see her. On that day, a courier just misses Delacere's carriage as it leaves for business, and he tells Arno that he has a letter that absolutely must reach him today. Arno doesn't know it yet, but this letter would warn Delacere of an impending assassination attempt. Arno can tell that this guy doesn't understand efficient side hops, so he takes the letter himself and follows Delacere to make sure it gets to him on time. 
Arno tracks him to the Estates General, where he sees Elise and her father from afar, and almost makes it to Delessere. Unfortunately, his reckless behavior and bad reputation get in the way, and two blacksmiths that he got in a scuffle with earlier follow and jump him. Arno is able to handle them, but this sends the guards his way and his delivery attempt is thwarted. Back at square one, he asks Olivier, a servant of the house who clearly doesn't like him, when Delessere will be home. Olivier tells him he's not expected back until late, which at first doesn't bother Arno, because he believes this means he will be able to spend the day with Elise. As a note, we just saw Elise with her father at the Estates General, so I don't know why the heck he thinks she'll be coming back at a different time without him, but we'll get back to Arno's lack of critical thinking in a second. Olivier explains that Elise is actually going to be at a giant party held in her honor at the King's Palace, and Arno wasn't invited. Well, surely this was a mistake, so he prepares himself to crash that party, only... <sighs> camera zooms in on the letter in his pocket. How late is late, he asks, and Olivier dismisses the question entirely, saying he doesn't know. So Arno now has a choice to make between duty and Elise, and he chooses duty. He goes back inside to wait for Delessere. The game then takes a moment to sit with Arno in his restlessness. He walks around the room, looking at books he hated reading as a child, but perking up remembering the books that Elise liked. He doesn't last five minutes. Elise over duty, he will slip the letter under Delessere's door. He will see it as soon as he comes home, he rationalizes to himself. But there is clear hesitation. The game holds a moment on Arno as he clearly struggles with this decision and knows he should wait, but his obsession over Elise wins that fight. He wants his moment with her, and he gets it, in a scene so picturesque that it manages to rise above the awkward texture pop-in that still does burden even this moment. The two share a chase, they share a kiss, and we see that their relationship has blossomed into something passionate and mischievous over the years. They seem to bring out the best and worst in one another. It only lasts a moment, but like Ezio, a moment is all he needs. One kiss and he is satisfied, and he begins to leave the palace a happy man. That elation doesn't last. Out in the courtyard of the palace, a wall away from where his father died 13 years ago, he watches Monsieur de la Serre drop dead. Arno runs over, and a voice off-screen yells for the guards, framing Arno for the murder. Delessere is gone, and Arno's life is shattered. Riveting stuff. Effective, especially with the amazing performances of Dan Janot and Catherine Berube, but I want us to stop here for a moment and reflect on what actually happened. Let's rewind. Uh, how late is late? Arno believes he has to wait for Delessere to come home if he wants to go to the party the party for Delessere's daughter, being held at the Palace of Versailles that seemingly the entire city is attending. Come on, Arno, take a wild guess where Delessere is. You think he's out having a drink or something? Go to the party because he's obviously there, give him the letter, and then find Elise. It's perfect. But the game doesn't even acknowledge that as a possibility. It's very much written as if Arno would have no reason to believe that Elise and her father would be at the same place at the same time, and that choosing one would mean forsaking the other. But fine, let's hand wave that. So now the game focuses on Arno's boredom and restlessness, making it clear to the player that in Arno's head, his choice is firmly between waiting at the estate or going to the party. We get all this time where Arno mulls over his options, and the story frames this as the point where Arno seals Delessere's fate. But again, Delessere is at the party. He was never coming home from that party one way or another. If Arno had overcome his obsession with Elise and stayed at the estate, he would have been sitting on the couch and Delessere would have died anyways. Arno's decision to slip the letter under the door changes absolutely nothing. So why does the game zoom in on the letter as Arno tries to leave for the party, and why does it focus on his hesitation before slipping the note under the door? It's just so baffling that this central plot point is so muddled. What makes it especially frustrating is that there is a strong argument for Arno's role in the man's death, but his decision to slip the letter under the door had nothing to do with it. Had Arno been more mature and not made so many enemies, the blacksmiths wouldn't have jumped him and he would have gotten the letter to Delessere on time. But the game never frames it like that, and the writers instead seem to want to imply that it is Arno's obsession with Elise that causes him to forsake duty and go to the party, and that eventually gets Delessere killed. As a player, we just started the game, and I already have to engage in some high-level mental gymnastics to make this ostensibly simple plot point make sense. I have to accept that Arno doesn't figure out that Delessere is at the party, even though I can think of no other logical conclusion he could have come to, and I have to accept that despite the inclusion of this scene with the letter and how much the writers emphasize it, nothing that happens after the blacksmith fight actually matters, and I shouldn't worry about it. 
This is arguably the most important moment in the game, and I can't believe they didn't have their writers do a once-over to make sure their simple revenge and betrayal setup actually made sense. Alright, I have to move on because I've spent seven minutes talking about just the intro, but luckily I don't feel a need to go into as much detail with individual events from here on out, largely due to how the game structures its plot from this point on. Once Arno dons the hood and the blade, the story gets much sparser and much less character-driven. There are 12 sequences in this game, and a majority of them only have two or three missions per sequence. By contrast, Assassin's Creed 3 had multiple five mission sequences and a total of 46 missions. Unity, despite having the same number of sequences, only has 29 when you take away the Rift missions that take place outside of the story. Now, that's not inherently a bad thing. We always take quality over quantity, but I wouldn't say that the quality is there. Most sequences have a primary target at the center of them, and one of the missions is the black box itself. That means there are several sequences where you get all your build-up, investigation, and backstory figured out in one mission, and then you assassinate the target in the next. This obviously doesn't give room for anyone in the game to shine a whole lot. Arno, who starts out charming but witty in a somewhat rude way that sets him apart from Ezio, loses a lot of his luster at this point. His sarcastic quips start becoming a majority of his dialogue, thinly veiling how rarely he has anything of substance to say. The few side characters who do get some play have their own stories played through at warp speed to accommodate the pace of the game. Arno gets trained in the ways of the assassins by Pierre Belek while they are imprisoned together at the Bastille, and the instant mark he makes is quickly followed up with him fading to the background for most of the story. Likewise, Arno meets duplicitous men like the Marquis de Sade and Napoleon, and after a tense moment of initial distrust with both, Arno is venting to them like it's a slumber party within a couple lines of dialogue. You used me. Your target is dead. We used one another. Every time I think I'm getting close to the truth, it seems another layer of filth presents itself. <gasps> Conspiracy! I do hope we're not eyeing the same prize. Name it. Certain letters written to the king? It makes the story feel so rushed, and it makes Arno feel stupidly trusting. The targets themselves get it even worse. Despite having some really cool black box missions around them, these are some powerfully forgettable targets. You learn so little about them and what their role within the Order is, and Arno never gets the chance to speak with any of them before they die. Instead of the traditionally fantastic memory corridors after each kill, Arno has this strange ability where he can take on their memories to find his next target. These are poorly lit sequences that at best give us information in a very sterile way, and at worst try to make us empathize with enemies who had one line of dialogue at the start of the mission. Why are you showing me this woman's childhood right now? I already forgot her name. The pacing just feels so off throughout the game, and so little happens per sequence because it's trying to juggle so much. It's a love story, but it's about the French Revolution, but it's about the assassins, but it's a character study. They tried to do too much, and didn't work nearly hard enough to make any individual component work. I suppose now is as good a time as any to start talking about these poorly juggled components, and I want to focus on three in particular. The Assassin-Templar conflict, the French Revolution, and Arnaud's love story. All three are a part of the game from the very start, but they really get into a groove in sequence two. Imprisoned for Delessaire's death at the Bastille, Arno meets an assassin named Pierre Belec, whom I mentioned earlier, who reveals to him that his father was an assassin, and that Delessaire was the Templar Grand Master. In typical redemption story fashion, the old man trains Arno, and they spend two months locked in intense one-on-one -on -one combat. This is where the revolution comes in. We have actually gotten a taste of it already. The Estates General, in the background of the beginning of the game, was the assembly that really started the revolution on its track, but the storming of the Bastille here is the moment that really introduces the player to the French Revolution. Unfortunately, after this introduction, the Revolution plays little to no role in the main plot for about two-thirds of the game, so we already have to put that one on hold. Belek and Arno use the chaos to escape, and Arno is offered a place with the assassins in what is probably the most effective use of the iconic leap of faith of all time. However, the assassins aren't his first stop, and we get an update on the third component, love story. Except there isn't much love there right now. Elise reveals she always knew about their conflicted heritage, and that she is now a fully-fledged Templar. Not only that, but she knows Arno failed to deliver the letter that would have saved her father. 
Delacere's death may have put this story in motion, but it is at this moment, where Arno feels he has lost Elise, that he is set on his path. People sometimes peg this as a revenge story, but it really never was. Arno isn't doing what he does to honor Delacere. He needs to make things right for Elise, because she is what matters to him. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, the game hits a bit of a lull here. Because of the rushed pace, Elise just had her second real scene in the game, but she won't pop back up in this story until around the halfway point. And so we just watched the title card, and now two of the three big components I just mentioned, the love story and the revolution, have already been put on ice. That leaves the assassins, the component which dominates the first half of the game, but has its own set of problems. They start out really strong. Arno goes to them when he has nowhere else to turn, and we are met with a brotherhood that is mysterious and traditional. Instead of a variety of quirky personalities like we got in the Ezio trilogy, we have a veritable army of trained foot soldiers under the command of a council of five. But this brotherhood extends beyond tradition. The mentor of this branch, Mirabeau, subverts expectations by wanting to be a peacemaker to end the war between the Assassins and Templars. He wants to politicize the Assassins, and he had set up a truce with Delisere before his death, which is why they didn't immediately turn Arno away for joining just to avenge a Templar. I thought the ideas behind this were really cool, but unfortunately they don't get fleshed out much at all. Of the five council members, I can only remember the names of Mirabeau and Belek, with the other three being entirely disposable. Beyond the council, Arno never interacts with any assassins at his own rank, and they act as faceless goons that occupy the hideout. The biggest problem is that it feels like the writers laid out Arno's story and then haphazardly wrote the assassins around it. Arno only speaks with them once per mission, and that's only in the first half of the game, something I'm going to address again later. They vaguely point him in the direction of his first two targets, but it's Elise, Desaad, and Napoleon that actually give him concrete intel for his investigation over the course of the story. The assassins train him and equip him, but by the time the story catches up with Arno after his two years of training, they really have nothing left to offer him beyond the occasional scolding. This isn't a one-way problem. The assassins aren't much use to Arno, but likewise I struggle to understand what value Arno holds to them. He spends two years as a novice off-screen, so it's implied he was making himself useful somehow, but once he graduates to becoming a legitimate assassin, we exclusively see him following his own personal quest. Why the assassins let him do this is left vague. There's no discernible plot against the assassins to be found in the first half of the game that would threaten France or the Brotherhood, so they really are just letting Arno kill these targets for the sake of Delessaire, who, truce or not, was a Templar but at least they will have more to do once the Templar's plot is actually revealed, right? I'll get to that. I like the idea of a main character who uses the assassins to further his own goals, but we don't see any of the compromises required for him to be able to do that. Despite being a low-ranking assassin, we never see him take on any grunt work that benefits the Council instead of just himself. Once again, it is a travesty that the only real Brotherhood missions were relegated to the co-op, we could have fleshed out the Council so much more if these missions were integrated with the main story and gave us dialogue between Arno and other assassins, but they failed to give us that, and so Arno's value to the assassins is told, but not shown. So for a chunk of the game here up to the halfway point, things are weird. Elise has disappeared, the revolution is on the back burner, and Arno is technically an assassin, but his quest still feels entirely personal and disconnected from the Brotherhood. This comes to a head in sequence 5, when Arno, having crossed two names off his list, tracks down a silversmith named Germain who forged the weapon that killed Delessaire. He claims he was a prisoner of a Templar named Lafreniere, who had Delessaire killed so he could fill his seat. Well, that's enough for Arno. He goes out and finds Lafreniere and kills him. Only this time, believing time was of the essence, we didn't get our scene of him asking the Brotherhood for permission first. We then get the first scene in the game where we are reminded that there are rules, and the assassins won't just let Arno do whatever he wants. Killing a man without permission is seen as a gross violation of his rank and responsibilities, and that's not even the kicker. He killed the wrong man. Lafreniere was an ally of Delessaire, and Arno was tricked by Germain himself. We learn that the Templars, like the assassins, were moving toward peace and passivity, and Germain struck back at this perceived corruption by staging a coup and having Delessaire killed. Remember when I said that Arno feels stupidly trusting? And so, what is Arno's punishment? Well, nothing. They even let him keep control of the Delessaire investigation. Again, I really wish we got some idea as to why Arno was worth keeping around to them, because we don't see him benefit the assassins in a meaningful way. 
and yet at the same time, we see them tolerate a lot from him. Either way, we are wrapping up sequence 5, and the assassins warn Arno not to go killing without permission anymore. Remember that. It'll be important later. On the plus side, Lafreniere's death brings Elise back into the fray, but maybe not in the best way. Lafreniere was actually Elise's only remaining ally among the Templars, and so Arno has to go and find her to save her from Germain's men, since she is now his only remaining threat. He dances around the fact that he murdered the only person left on her side, and on top of that, by killing Lafreniere, he seemingly dissolved the largest force standing in Germain's way, leaving only Elise. After Arno kills him, that military force that Lafreniere was rallying are just gone. They are not shown again. This was a civil war before, and now it's just Elise versus the entire Templar order, and it's all Arno's fault. You'd think she'd be mad about that, but it is literally never acknowledged. Neither the assassins nor Elise hold Arno accountable for single-handedly paving the way for their enemy's ascension. Remember earlier in this game when a misplaced letter was a big enough sin to jumpstart the entire plot of the game? Oh, I guess things are just different now. The two instead reconcile and decide to work together again. However, while the chemistry between the actors is still present, their interactions have become much colder due to the harsh years apart. This is realistic, but I found myself missing the interesting banter, which has been replaced by a bunch of scenes where Arno basically hangs by her like a sad puppy, and I wanted more meaningful scenes between them. Just as we start getting an idea of the true plot of the game with Germain's emergence, we are pulled on a mid-story tangent. Arno decides he hasn't fully communicated just how much he loves Templars to the Council, so he straight up brings Elise to them for help. This upsets everyone but Mirabeau, who is always up for peace talks, but the issue is tabled to avoid escalation in the hideout. Unfortunately, next time we see Mirabeau, he is dead in his bed, with a trail leading straight to Elise. Arno doesn't suspect her for a second, but to be fair, he doesn't seem to suspect anyone in this game for a second. He's a gullible guy. After some detective work, Arno finds the real killer atop the Saint-Chapelle, Belek. Remember Belek, the guy from the beginning of the game? He gets to matter again, so that's cool. And remember the inklings of a more passive and political assassin brotherhood? Well, this scene would have hit a lot harder if we got more than just inklings. Apparently, just like Germain with the Templars, Belek believes that the assassins have lost their way, and that peace with Elise would have been the last straw. A coup was necessary, and he wants Arno on his side. Wait, what? You want Arno on your side? This guy hasn't shut up about his Templar pals for the entire game. I know your heart is set on keeping the peace, but bringing Monsieur de la Serre's killer to justice would count for something, wouldn't it? I owe it to the memory of Monsieur de la Serre to uncover the truth. Tell me, did you ever really believe in the creed? Or were you a Templar loving traitor from the start? I, yes, he was. What game have you been playing? Belek was there for all of these scenes. How did he not realize that Arno was just there to avenge his favorite Templars? Anyhow, you get this awful fight, and after a limp attempt to get some last-minute sympathy by showing that Belek saved Arno's forgotten first dad once, we have now lost the only two assassins who have had any personality in this entire game, which does not bode well for their part of the story. Except... Now we reach sequence 8, and things actually start improving. Nothing really comes of this mini-coup narratively, and the idea of the assassins helping Elise is just straight up dropped. But it acts as a bit of a narrative reset, and Arno is finally told to stop worrying about his own problems and actually start being an assassin. He's given a real mission for the first time in this game, sneak into the king's study and steal some documents. I'll be honest, Arno's response to this is a bit frustrating. More fetch and carry work, I imagine. Please, Arno, tell us what fetch and carry work you have been doing. I desperately want to know. These people have tolerated you for so long that you must have been clearing out entire countries worth of Templars off screen for them to have kept you around. That aside, how can an assassin sneak into a royal study? Well, because the Paris Commune has declared itself an open insurrection against the king. Remember the French Revolution? The thing this game is supposed to revolve around, but that we haven't seen any real signs of since the storming of the Bastille at the beginning? It's back. And on top of it all, Arno and Elise are now actually working together in earnest. In sequence 8, two-thirds into this game, the love story, the assassins, and the revolution are all front and center again. Finally. And so, with some help from Elise, you assassinate a Templar who has been restricting food to rile up the populace, a captain of the French army who was leading the September massacres, 
and a Templar politician who cast the final vote to execute the king. Finally, we get targets who are actually impacting France and have a clear role within the Templars, something we really didn't get for the entire first half of the game. The assassin plot is at its best, the revolution is finally ramping up, and the romance is about to peak as well. When Elise finds herself in some trouble, she and Arno end up fleeing in a hot air balloon, in what is probably the most exciting set piece of the entire game. With adrenaline high and their investigation actually bearing fruit, the pair finally rekindle their romance in the skies above Paris. It's all coming together, and if it sticks to landing, then maybe I can excuse some of the sloppiness that we've been dealing with so far. With all the pawns off the board, Arno and Elise are ready for Germain. He is in attendance at the king's execution, and they try to go and intercept him, but it's a trap, and Arno is once again forced to choose between duty and Elise. He chooses the same way he always has, and Germain escapes. This infuriates Elise, who may have warmed up to Arno again, but has in no way cooled off in her desire for revenge. Killing Germain is all that matters to her, and since Arno is just in the way, she drops him then and there. Arno, who can't catch a break, is promptly reprimanded for attempting an assassination on Paris' highest stage, and the assassins expel him too. And you know what? Good for them. Remember when I said Arno actually took on a real mission from the assassins that didn't tie into his own selfish goals back in Sequence 8? Well, that wasn't a sign of great things to come. That is literally the last time we see the assassins until this expulsion scene. I said to remember that Mirabeau told Arno not to go killing without permission back in Sequence 5, right? Well, that was the last time that Arno ever brings up a target to the Council. The assassins sanction the first two out of nine primary targets, yell at Arno for the third, and then don't show up for a single one after that. It's not until Sequence 8 that we finally have real events involving the revolution and a concrete plot from the Templars. Here, where the assassins finally have a threat worth acknowledging that extends beyond Arno's personal revenge quest, is where the assassins utterly disappear from this story. Post Mirabeau, they show up a single time before this expulsion. It's mind-boggling that the writers just forgot about the assassins, giving them precisely zero involvement with this story in the second half of the game. If you want to show us that this branch of the assassins is useless, then do it. Show us the fetch and carry work, show us them ignoring leads, give us a reason for Arno to go rogue. We really get none of that. So let's reflect then, what do we get in this game? What do the assassins actually do? They train Arno, yes. But what then? You could argue that they lead him to Siver, but they wouldn't have even known that Siver was Delacere's killer if Arno didn't tell them. After that, every target is discovered either through Arno's magic memory leech or with help from his non-assassin allies. How would this game have been different if Arno had been expelled before he even killed his first target? It wouldn't have. Arno's quest is entirely independent from them once he becomes an assassin, and the only time they impact the plot in a way that isn't strictly performative is when they briefly start killing each other in the middle of the game. When all is said and done, the primary purpose that the assassins actually manage to serve is that they let Arno be a part of a rivaling organization to Elise, giving them this Romeo and Juliet-esque forbidden love. That's really it. And so what happens next for the assassins then? Nothing. That's the final scene that they are in. The assassins, as they pertain to this narrative, are done. What a waste. In the end, the assassins feel more shoehorned into this game than almost any other in this series, despite how prominent they are throughout. I mean, look at AC4. Edward is not an assassin, and his interactions with the Brotherhood are limited, and yet the assassins get way more screen time in his game than in Unity, and the philosophies of the assassins and Templars are integral to his own journey. Odyssey, a game set before assassins or Templars even exist, puts much more effort into prioritizing the series' central themes of how much liberty one should compromise for the sake of peace. Valhalla, a game where I made a video spending several minutes talking about how badly done the assassin versus Templar plot was, had a version of the Hidden Ones with a clearer purpose in the story than the assassins get in Assassin's Creed Unity. Write the assassins out of this game, and almost nothing changes. I think Unity's liberal use of traditional iconography gives people the illusion that it is truer to its roots than it actually is, and while the assassins are physically in this game more than some others, I think this is one of their least developed iterations. So now there are two sequences left, and the entire purpose of the assassins in this story has been wrapped up and the love story is on hold again. But at least we still do have the revolution. The king has finally been executed, so let's get into it. Now we get to see the reign of terror, right? Arno gets drunk and wallows in his sadness for the entire penultimate sequence. Remember all those cinematic trailers where Arno is fighting his way through what clearly seems to be the Reign of Terror? 
Turns out that gets to be two forgettable missions in the final chapter of the game. Elise, for whatever reason, changes her mind, and with no one having learned anything from this little detour, they return to the fray. They target Maximilien Robespierre, one of the most recognizable figures from the French Revolution. Now, anyone with a basic knowledge of the French Revolution knows that shoving Robespierre into the game in the final chapter and introducing him after his downfall has already begun is confounding. His name is synonymous with the Reign of Terror, and the Reign of Terror is synonymous with the French Revolution. So why do neither play a meaningful role in AC Unity? It's beyond me. With these two Robespierre missions done, the revolution is a wrap in this story as well. They really dropped the ball here, and they made the revolution a barely there backdrop to an already paper-thin story. Having the king's death happen in sequence 10, and for so little of the revolution to be explored after that is just such a shame. Characters like Robespierre do show up in the co-op missions, but as I said, those don't really tie back into the main story in any way. There is so much that they could have done with this setting, and yet there is so very little in the side content or the main story that immerses me in the French Revolution. And that sucks. And so there is only one pillar of this narrative left. The love story. The pair finds Germain, who has armed himself with the Sword of Eden so he can shoot lasers at us for a dumb-looking boss fight. In the commotion, Arno is trapped beneath some rubble, and now it is Elise who gets to make a choice. She is not Arno. She leaves him and charges in for her revenge. Arno is able to wiggle free, but he's too late. Her blade clashes with the Sword of Eden, and the ensuing explosion kills her instantly. The only person that motivated Arno to do anything at all in this game is gone. She gets no final words as he hovers over her body, and the cold silence of this moment is allowed to sit longer than almost anything ever does in this narrative. For the first time, Arno is indeed motivated by revenge. He slowly pushes his blade through Germain's head, but it doesn't matter. Elise is gone, and that is how this story ends. This love story is by far the most effective of those primary components I mentioned earlier. It is shallow, it shouldn't have taken half the game to start up again, and we didn't get half the scenes between the two of them that would have justified the emotions that this honestly effective ending deserved. But the pair are charmingly acted, and in their story you can see a glimpse of a deeper message about obsession, revenge, and how nationwide conspiracies and revolutions can seem trivial in the shadow of personal grief. It's a shame that this story gets drowned out by the sloppiness of everything else. The game wraps up with one final, unearned monologue from Arno, talking about his new interpretation of the Creed as if this game did anything to make the assassins or their philosophy worthwhile in the entire game. And then we hit credits. Oh, what a mess that was. Once again, good ideas. French Revolution, great place to explore that freedom versus peace story that we get in Assassin's Creed. Assassins and Templars straying from their roots and getting marred in politics? That sounds like a great idea, go on. Splinter factions of both organizations causing civil wars to break out. That sounds cool. But like the rest of this experience, any great ideas to come out of the writing room were mashed into a paste and processed with the rest of this cobbled together mess of a video game. Terrible pacing means I don't care about any of the characters. The Assassin Templar conflict is a thimble deep despite its potential. The revolution is absolutely wasted. And the half-baked love story somehow emerges as the best part of this story. I don't think a lot of people actually want a return to the storytelling in Unity. I think some people want a return to the type of story that Unity's trailers made us think it would tell. But don't let the hood and the blade fool you. This is far from a traditional Assassin's Creed story that respects its roots, and even more importantly, it's far from a good story. The potential of AC Unity was crystal clear. The traversal system is borderline revolutionary, the story brushes against tackling legitimately subversive themes, the combat and stealth have clearer design philosophies than any of the past games, and the world is heart-stoppingly beautiful at times. There are moments where I scale a building and crest over a rooftop to see a cityscape that takes my breath away, and in these moments I think to myself, perhaps I am being too harsh. The highs like that are so very high, and so non-existent anywhere else in this industry. But within seconds, I am always brought back down to earth. These elements could have been great if they worked, but they simply did not. My immersion in the world is shattered by hideous texture pop-in and hollow side content. My enthrallment in the parkour is ruined by choppy animation blending and overly automated systems. 
The interesting story ideas couldn't even stay consistent through the first 10 minutes of the game, and the stealth and combat systems catch fire on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. But the potential must still mean something, right? Well, it can. The people online who show you how fantastic Unity can look are not lying to you. The people who I consider most influential when it comes to showcasing what this game can be at its best are usually very honest and vocal about the flaws of this game, but are willing to push through to the innovations beneath. Leo K said it best in a review of sorts he did a few years back. He says, 99% of Unity high skill gameplay and tech is literally the borderline academic field of study that governs when and where and why and how all of these janky situations come up. Being good at this game is defined as successfully evading these scenarios and being unfair to the game back. Broken as the game may be, there is a level of freedom that exists deep within that a player who is willing to put in the work can dig out, and that is awesome. I would never tell someone they shouldn't be having fun with a game they like. But at the same time, I do not believe the triumphs of these creators erase the many failures of Ubisoft when it comes to this game. If you have to fight that hard to enjoy a game, something did go wrong on the development end, and I simply cannot excuse the flaccid mess that encapsulates every good idea in this game. I do not owe Ubisoft the work of building a worthwhile experience out of their broken mechanics when it was their corporate greed and cut corners that made Unity what it is. This video is ridiculously long, and I appreciate you if you've made it this far, and if you just skip to the end, I can't blame you there either. But trust me when I say I cut out a lot of negative criticism in order to keep this at least marginally respectful of your time. I didn't bring up the terrible modern day story that is so meaningless that I could just fill you in on the whole thing in a sentence or two, but I'm still not going to because it's just that bad. I didn't talk about the completely one-sided tie-in with AC Rogue, which solves the mystery of Arno's first dad's death, but never gets acknowledged because Unity was probably fully scripted by the time Rogue started development. I barely touched on the marketing campaign. They gave us three CG trailers, all of which portrayed Arno as a champion of the revolution, only to make him barely interact with the revolution at all. I didn't talk about the DLC, which is a legitimately fun time that actually gives Arno more narrative focus and desperately needed closure, but which was, for me, too little too late. And finally, I didn't bring up the glitches, because truly they just distract from the real problems in Unity. The game is messed up, with or without glitches, and people use the they just hated it because it was broken excuse quite a bit. But just because I don't focus on them here doesn't mean they're not there. I was experiencing a wide variety of glitches every time I hit the record button. This game, in its patch state, is still one of, if not the, glitchiest game I've ever played. When I look at the sum of Unity's parts, each of which is mangled and mutilated in their own ways, I see a bad game. Not a flawed masterpiece, not a hidden gem, not a rough product on the brink of something amazing. Just the same bad game it was in 2014 and every year after, patches or none. I understand how it feels to look at Unity and wish that was the direction the series went. Even as a big Origins and Odyssey fan, I know I would still rather have the urban social stealth simulator where you spend your time investigating targets and taking them out in creative ways. But vision isn't enough. A bad game with bad ideas and a bad game with good ideas are both bad games. People see Unity as the antithesis of a game like Valhalla. But while the basic design philosophies may be in direct opposition with one another, I see Unity and Valhalla as birds of a feather. Rush development, half-baked ideas, technical instability, and terrible microtransactions are all hallmarks of the greed of modern Ubisoft, and they are just as present in Unity as they are in Valhalla. I may rank Valhalla as my least favorite AC game, but I do want you to know that between it and Unity, the contest is very close. I know we can have a game where the parkour is exciting but functional, where the combat and stealth have depth that stands apart from other games, where the world is full of immersive things to do and reasons to explore, and where the story is told competently and respectfully. But Unity never even got close to being that game. We've seen the footage from Mirage, and while it looks like it could be a lot of fun, it's clearly not going to innovate the parkour and the social stealth in especially meaningful ways. Chances are, Ubisoft has no intention of giving us the game so many people have asked for since AC1. But even if I don't believe Ubisoft will ever even give us that game, that doesn't mean I can't believe we deserve it. Because as I've said so many times now, I know we deserve better than the creative and technical slap in the face that is Assassin's Creed Unity. That was a ride. Thank you for sticking with me. 
I hope if you disagree with me, you'll be willing to talk about it in a civil way in the comments, because I know a lot of people are passionate about this game, and I'd love to chat about it here or on my Patreon, which I have linked in my description. But otherwise, that is, finally, all I have for today. Have a great day, and please do take care of yourself. Ugh. <laughs>